All right, good evening. If we could make our way to our seats. And let's turn to hymn number 75, Saw You Never in the Twilight. Leading us in prayer is Pastor Rob Hadding from Christ Church in Pace, Florida. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your kind providence. We pray this evening that you would give grace to the speakers, that you would open the ears of the hearers, and that you would cause us to be blessed by what we hear. Father, we give you thanks for all things, and we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let's welcome Dr. Mark David Hall once again. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here again. This has been a wonderful, absolutely wonderful conference and fellowship. So the um, topic tonight, tonight is Wendike Contra Tyrannos, the influence of, of the Reformed tradition on the American founding. Let me begin by a warning. There is no shortage of books along the lines of how the Baptist invented religious liberty, how the Quakers founded America, how the Presbyterians did X and Y and Z. It's very, very common for adherents to a tradition to want to attribute great things to that tradition. And so in the spirit of full disclosure, I would say my family and I worship in an Anglican church and I'm very sympathetic to reformed theology, uh, but it's not actually the tradition out of which I come. So what I'm doing tonight is not engaging in special pleading, arguing for my tradition. I'm making an argument based on what I found in the historical record. And what I found is that the influence of Christianity broadly and the reformed tradition or the Calvinist tradition on America's founders has been grossly neglected by scholars. Let me begin just by one quote, and I can give you a dozen of these quotes. The um, Pulitzer Prize winning author, Jack Rakoff, a professor at Stanford, one of the most respected historians in the land, in his book, Original Meanings, writes this, the larger intellectual world within which the Constitution is often located, the enlightened world of Black Locke and Blackstone, human, human Montesquieu, the plain wings and the real wings, the common lawyers and the continental jurists has been subject of extensive analysis. Did you notice he's talking about maybe eight different schools of thought and he doesn't even 
suggest religion, Christianity, Protestantism, or Calvinism as something that's worthy to be considered as an influence upon America's founders. And you see this, in fact, in book after book on the American founding. In fact, it's very, very common for authors to make this sort of argument. The founders were mostly deist, they created a godless constitution, and they desired to strictly separate church and state. Um, th this is just a, a horrible historical argument, and a good bit of my work historically has been to try to set the record straight. Now, how do these, I mean, these are good people, and I don't think they're part of a conspiracy to try to undermine Christianity or something like that. So how do they come to this, I, th I think, very erroneous view of history? Well, there's one um, major reason, I think. It's very tempted when we look at America's founders, we are drawn to indisputably great men. A Thomas Jefferson, a James Madison, a George Washington, an Alexander Hamilton, a Thomas Paine, a Ben Franklin, and a John Adams. Everyone I just mentioned is an Anglican. That is a, a, what we now, well, back then it would have been called the member of the Church of England or an Anglican. Only John Adams, in fact, by the end of his life, continued to be a member of a reformed congregation. Um, he was, in fact, a Congregationalist, although personally, he was not a good Calvinist. And so what I would suggest, in, in this era, only about 15% of Americans are Anglicans, and yet when we think about the founders, we know virtually all of them are Anglican or are worshiping at Anglican churches by the end of their lives. And this applies even to people like Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin, who we know are not Orthodox Christians, but nonetheless, for all intents and purposes, for all, um, all they appear to people, they are in fact Anglicans. And for Jefferson and most of the rest, that's a tradition in which they were um, raised. On the other hand, Calvinists make up about 50 to 75% of the American population, and yet they tend to be overlooked by scholars. And so, in part, what I'm going to try to do is set the historical record straight. Um, if you're interested, I, I, I provide a lot of evidence to support this argument in my book, Roger Sherman and the Creation of the American Republic. We'll talk about Sherman in a little bit. He's a reformed reformer. Um, you know, this is a serious Latter-day Puritan. His minister is Jonathan Edwards, Jr. He writes sermons. He's a ruling elder in his church. And he is not alone. There are lots of founders that are very similar to Sherman. And yet, generally, these, these very important founders, um, very pious founders, are neglected by students of the founding generation. Before I get to the American founding, though, we need to take a big step back and talk about reformed political theory. Um, what, what, what is reformed political theory and how does it differ from what has come before us? The, um, probably the best thing to do is, is to start with the Protestant Reformation, broadly. We can date this to 1517 when Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle. Now Protestants, and here I'm talking about the Protestant tradition generally, as you well know, they emphasize, Protestants emphasize certain doctrines. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura, the priesthood of all believers. And I know you guys, even the youngest of students here, have probably talked about these before in class. What you might not have thought about are the political implications of some of these doctrines. Take, for instance, sola scriptura plus priesthood of all believers. If we know God's will for us through the scripture, and we're all responsible for it. We aren't just going to defer to the priest or the minister or whatever else you want to call him. Um, what, what follows from this? We need to be literate. We need to be able to read the Bible for ourselves. And so what you see in Protestant countries is an absolute explosion of literacy. Let me give you one example of this. In the mid-17th century, literacy rates in Italy, in France, are roughly 25%. Um, if you look to New England at the same time, New England, which is, which is populated almost solely by Reformed Christians, the literacy rate among males is 95%. Virtually every male could read, and actually female literacy is, is, is really quite high as well, because these are, these are Calvinists, right? They want their children to grow up being able to read the Bible so they can decide what the Bible says for themselves. Almost any theorist of, of democratization, what does it take for a country to become democratic, will say widespread literacy is pretty much a prerequisite for this. And, and I, I think as well, widespread literacy and priesthood of all believers, it undermines existing hierarchy. So there's political implications just to Protestantism broadly. But I want to focus a little more narrowly on Calvinism. 
um, followers broadly of John Calvin. Now, of course, any good Calvinist would say, I'm not a follower of John Calvin, I'm a follower of the Bible, but I can read Calvin and get things of interest from him. So Calvin's followers are generally called Calvinists, um, and he's you know, a very important figure, obviously, within um, this tradition, and yet it does not stop and begin with him. Now he has a number of ideas that are, that are explicitly relevant for politics. Let me mention one. Um, he believed and he emphasized that Jesus Christ is Lord of all creation. It, it, our Christian conviction should inform everything we do, not just how we live our lives. It should inform how we structure our families, how we structure society, how we engage in politics, how we do business, right? And those of you in the know know I'm kind of wading into a one kingdom versus two kingdom debates, and I'm taking a pretty strong stance here. I think Calvin is a one kingdom guy, and this characterizes the tradition. So um, I, I, I don't want to emphasize that at this point, although we'll touch on it briefly in a little bit, what I want to do instead, and again, there's a lot of doctrines we could talk about, but I want to talk about one that's particularly relevant in the American context. So Calvinism, as you know, it sprouts up in Switzerland, but it also becomes pretty prevalent in Holland, in um, France, and even in England as well, right? The problem is the Catholic princes at the time do not like this, and so they try to stomp it out. And the French Huguenots are, in fact, basically stomped out. Well, these, uh, this sort of um, violent attack upon the, the Calvinists help, helped encourage them, I think it's fair to say, to rethink what cr Christians had traditionally thought about political tyranny. So for about 1,300 years, the, the church said, and most Christians believe, look, Romans 13 says that government is ordained by God and Christians ought to be subject to it. If the government tells us to bow down and worship Baal, obviously we don't, but we take the punishment, right? Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we allow ourselves to be thrown in the fiery furnace. Just like Daniel, we let ourselves uh, be lowered into the lion's den. We don't obey a tyrannical rule, a tyrannical order, but we don't rebel. We don't get to kill the tyrant. Um, in the 13th century, a few Catholics started fooling around with the idea that maybe there's a difference between a ruler and a tyrant, but this never really went very far within the, uh, Roman Catholicism. On the other hand, John Calvin, who is actually among the most conservative of the reformers on this question, in his Institutes, the last edition of the Institutes, 1559, I think it's crystal clear that he says inferior magistrates, in fact, should resist a, a, a superior magistrate who becomes a tyrant. And we could go into the biblical argument in more detail if you'd like, but the key distinction here is they suggest, they argue that Romans 13 is about a political ruler, not a political tyrant. Uh, they're different creatures, and if a ruler becomes a tyrant, the tyrant may be resisted. Now what's really important, again, to recognize is Calvin is among the more conservative of the reformers. Even as he was making this argument in the Institutes, you have John Knox up in Scotland saying, no, 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 the people themselves have a right and maybe even a duty to resist political tyranny. And then particularly among Anglo-Calvinists, people like John Ponet, George Buchanan, Samuel Rutherford, and so forth, they, they go on to say, again, they move very strongly in the tradition in the direction of saying, in fact, the people themselves may rise up to resist a tyrant. Some continue to use this language of inferior magistrates. They're a little bit worried about the hoi ploy, about the many, um, but many of them do come to the conclusion that if, in fact, if the inferior magistrates don't do their job, the people may justly rise up. Um, one of the most important works in this respect is, let's see, I'm skipping over a few things here. When Dicie contra Serranos, let's see, can we get there? Ah, there we go. Um, written by um, Stephanos Junius Brutus, which is a pseudonym, and there's a couple of different possibilities as to who wrote it, but that is not really important for us now. He writes this in 1579. This is 100 years, more than 100 years, before Locke, John Locke, publishes his second treatise on government. Listen to some of what he argues. He says that men originally exist in a state of natural liberty. And the natural law teaches us to preserve and protect our life and liberty, without which life is scarcely life at all, against all force and injustice. Humans are free by nature, impatient of servitude. They create governments to promote the common good. Legitimate rulers are established only by virtue of a twofold covenant, a covenant between the people and the ruler and between the ruler and God. 
do, do you see what's going on here? Um, he goes on to say that if, in fact, a ruler becomes tyrannical, the people may resist him. Think about what we're talking about here. People are individuals, are bearers of natural rights, government based on the consent of the governed, and a right to overthrow, overthrow a ruler who becomes tyrannical. Um, if you know the history of political philosophy, this sounds a lot like what people oftentimes attribute to John Locke, but keep in mind this is 100 years prior to Locke. I would say, in fact, Locke is a manifestation of the reform tradition of political reflection, not a massive departure from previous Christians who have come before him. And again, this is very important in the American context as we press down to the American founding because 50 to 75% of Americans are reasonably called Calvinist. Now let me just uh, trace this out a little bit, and it's particularly important because just last year we celebrated the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims landing um, in, at Plymouth, the Mayflower Compact. This year we can celebrate the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving. Um, so the Puritans, the American Puritans, I'm sure you know, are, are basically the descendants of English Puritans. Um, they were not happy. Henry VIII threw the Pope out, but basically he was happy with the Roman Catholic Church in England without the Pope. But these English Protestants who had sat, some of them at the feet of John Calvin, said, no, 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 we have to purify the Church of England. Now, a group of these in 1608 said, well, to heck with it. This is a lost cause. Let's go over to, um, to Holland. And things did not work so well in Holland. And so 1619, they came to America. One of the first things they did when, when they got to America is they created a compact, which really in their eyes was a covenant between themselves before the eyes of God, with God as the enforcer. And um, they, they covenanted themselves um, to create a colony for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Where did this covenant get its legitimacy from? From the consent of the males that signed it. And that seems a little unfair. It was the males, not the females. But still, this is remarkably, remarkably um, egalitarian, if you will. And again, it's this idea of the government by the consent of the governed. The, the, the Mayflower Compact is important because it represents what the Puritans who came to America in, in waves, in the 1630s especially, did all the time. Every time these reformers came together to create a town, to create a church, they created a covenant. And then they oftentimes governed themselves congregationally. The congregation would come together and debate things, elect ministers, fire ministers, and things of that nature. What I want you to understand is these Americans are practicing republicanism, republican government, hundreds of years before the war for American independence. One of my favorite students of the, um, of the Puritans is a fellow named David D. Hall of Yale Divinity School. Uh, no relation whatsoever to me, even though I'm Mark David Hall. You, think with our shared interests, I mean, we might be related, but we aren't. He writes that these, and to my knowledge, he's not reformed himself. He, he writes that these Calvinists had an animus against tyranny, an arbitrary power that pervaded every sermon and political statement. Now, there's a whole lot more we could say about the Pier, pilgrims and the Puritans that followed them, especially with respect to their legal reforms, which are remarkably progressive in the best sense of the word. But what I'm going to have to do is jump to the American founding to make sure I finish roughly on time. So um, let, let me begin. I've already made this assertion several times. Let me give you a little bit of support to it. Um, great historians, Sidney Alstrom of Yale, Harry Stout of Yale, have given similar estimates to what I've given. 50 to 75% of Americans in this era are reasonably called Calvinists. I should qualify that white Americans, Americans of European descent. Uh, of course, they dominate in New England. By the late 18th century, about 90% of Americans are reformed. We oftentimes think of the South as Anglican, and the Anglican Church was the established church, but what you had happen in the mid-18th century is lots of Scotch-Irish came over. And so oftentimes, as, as we head through the mid-Atlantic states to the south, um, many of these colonies would have 30 to 50 percent of the population would, would be reformed in one way or the other. And oftentimes, these folks are holding political office. In the 1770s, about 44 percent of Pennsylvania legislatures, legislators were Presbyterians, for instance. All right, so you got a lot of these folks all over the place. But, um, and again, I don't want to stoke your egos, but these, um, th these reformed Christians tended to be among the most educated people in all of America. So they created the great schools that we know to today, right? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and I'm using the, the, the modern names, of course. And, and they, they sent pedagogues throughout the nation. So for instance, let me just give you one example. James Madison, who was an Anglican, 
um, was educated by the Scottish Presbyterian minister Donald Robert Robertson, about whom he later said, this is to quote Madison, all that I have ever been in life, I owe largely to that man. Um, he also went to the college in New Jersey. There was a college in Virginia, the College of William & Mary. No one thought anything of that, right? That, that was not the place you wanted to go. So he went up to the College of New Jersey, today Princeton, um, which was led by John Witherspoon, the Scottish Presbyterian. Under Witherspoon, and here I'm quoting a very good scholar of, of, of this era and of Witherspoon, um, the, what Princeton produced five delegates to the Constitutional Convention, one U.S. president, a vice president, 49 U.S. representatives, 28 U.S. senators, three Supreme Court justices, eight district court justices, one secretary of state, three attorney generals, two foreign ministers. And it's noteworthy, I think, that only two of the 178 students that graduated from Princeton under Witherspoon were loyalists. Think about that. Two out of 178. So the College of New Jersey is doing something here, and it goes well beyond New Jersey. It's having influence throughout America, including on people like James Madison. Now, um, so my argument is that these Calvinists had, a, even though they were a majority, they had a disproportionate impact on American political thought, on American political debate. Now you might ask, okay, well, you know, that's, that's fine. You can give antidotes. Can you give any broader evidence, Professor Hall? Or you can call me Mark, that's fine. Um, let me just reference a study that was published in the American Political Science Review. Um, this was a content analysis done well before computers were advanced as they are today. And what these political science, scientists did is they went through all the political literature of the founding era, then they narrowed their sample down, and then they looked at who these political authors are citing. Um, you know, if you're making a speech, if you're, if you're writing an essay for the local paper, whatever, and you're citing authorities, who do you turn to? Who do you cite? Either because you believe this person has a lot of wisdom or because you know this person would have influence. Well, what he found, in fact, is that the Bible is cited about 34% of the time, all Enlightenment thinkers combined about 22% of the time. So the Bible is cited, it's quoted, it's cited, far more than Locke, Montesquieu, Hume, Bakari, all the Enlightenment thinkers put together. And it's notable that Don Lutz, who's not a bad guy, he's a conservative and whatnot, but he actually significantly undercounts references to the Bible because he tells us specifically he excluded political sermons that did not also cite secular authorities. And as well, in this era, it was routine for people to paraphrase the Bible without providing the, the citation. And so if you were to go back today with modern technology, I think you would find the Bible is cited or quoted probably twice as much as Enlightenment literature, which is exactly what you would expect of a reformed people. Well, let me, um, let, let me mention as well, John Adams, and I've already confessed, John Adams is raised in a reformed household. He goes to Harvard. He drifts. He drifts from the faith. We have to recognize that. We know that, not from anything he said publicly, but from his private correspondence and whatnot. Um, but nonetheless, he, um, in writing about the War for American Independence, he said that John Ponet's short treatise on politic power, 1556, contains all the essentials principles of liberty, which were afterwards deleted on by Sidney and Locke. He also specifically noted the significance of Windicke contra Tyrannos, which I talked about a minute ago. Um, late in life, and this is very um, enlightening, I think, he says, um, I love and revere the memories of Huss, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Melchon, and all the other reformers. Much however much I disagree with them on theological and metaphysical points. So he's admitting I'm not there theologically, but I understand that these guys had all the political principles that made the War for American Independence what it was. All right, there's more evidence I could give along these sorts of lines. What I think I want to do is um, look at three case studies. Well, I, I don't think I want to do I know I'm going to do it. I want to look at the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, and suggest ways in which I think these major key documents of, uh, of the American founding are influenced, informed by reformed political ideas. This is important because oftentimes the story of the Declaration is told as the story of Thomas Jefferson going off to a room by himself and writing a document based on his Enlightenment deism. Um, I, I'm not sure it's accurate to call Jefferson a deist. He clearly is not an Orthodox Christian, 
Um, he definitely is um, an Anglican. He's not Reformed. He's more enlightened than most Americans. Um, but in fact, the war for American independence must be understood in a much broader context. The, um, you have, of course, a traditional debate that we all know about taxa no taxation without representation. Um, there's some other debates, though, that occur, that, 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 that manifest themselves in many official documents that are absent from the Declaration of Independence, and I'll suggest one reason why that is. Um, let me just mention two of these, and I could mention more, but I want to mention two. One of the great fears of the colonists is that an Anglican bishop would be sent to British North America. Um, this political cartoon from the era, you can't read the words there, but the, the, the idea is that in fact a bishop is sent from England, an Anglican bishop, but there's a mob that won't let him land, and they're hurling books at him. And the book about to strike the poor bishop in the head is actually Calvin's works, the works of John Calvin. Now the fear here is to, in Anglican eyes, and I don't mean to, I know we have a lot of reformed clergy here, but in Anglican eyes, you guys aren't clergy at all, right? Because you were not ordained with bishops holding hands on you and this sort of thing. And so the fear was that a bishop would come over to England, New England and set things right, crack down on these dissenters, bring ecclesiastical law, bring ecclesiastical courts for the first time to British North America. There was actually a line in the, um, in, in the, in the Stamp Act that suggested that ecclesiastical courts would be brought to British North America to crack down on these Congregationalists and Presbyterians and others. Now, in retrospect, we know this was never a real threat, but to the minds of Calvinists who had been killed in, in, in France and unable to succeed in reforming the Church of England and persecuted elsewhere, this was a really, a, a very real fear. And in a form, um, so the, the War for American Independence was much more than no taxation without representation, which is a major, major constitutional violation. There was also this existential threat to religious liberty, which um, basically meant to their way of life. As well, and this will sound kind of obscure, um, but it was, a, it was a very real fear, the um, Quebec Act of 1774. This is, again, you have to understand there's maybe some miscommunication going on here. I think to Parliament, the Quebec Act was simply something to bring about a reasonable government, governance of um, the, 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 the province of Quebec. Um, but what the Quebec Act did is it ex actually extended Quebec down into the, the, the American Midwest, what became the American Midwest, and most significantly, it said we'll tolerate the Roman Catholic Church. Now, to many reformers, this is, you know, what are you doing? You can't do this. And in fact, in many of the initial petitions to Great Britain, they're, they're complaining about this sort of thing. Let me just mention one. The um, Declaration of Resolves, 1774, an official document of Congress, they um, complain about Parliament because Parliament established the Roman Catholic religion in the province of Quebec and went on to you know, violate a number of other important principles of English law. Now, this concern largely disappears from the Declaration of Independence. Why is that, you might ask? Well, I think there's a very practical reason. I love the Declaration of Independence. I love thinking about it as a statement, a basic statement of American political principles. But I think we have to recognize that a key audience for the Declaration of Independence is the King of France. America's, Americans want the King of France to come in on their side. And so it only makes sense that you're going to scrub these documents of this anti-Catholic rhetoric that is so pervasive in so many of these documents. Documents. Now, I'm not defending this in any way, shape, or form. Um, needless to say, some of my best, best friends are Roman Catholics. We have theological differences, but I love them. But to these Calvinists in 18th century America, the papists are the enemy, right? And this is a serious threat, again, to religious liberty. And so from the, the, the patriot side, you had fundamental threats to American li liberty. And to their way of thinking, they had absolutely no doubt in their mind that resistance to tyranny is both biblical and um, morally justified. They had been working with this tradition for over 150 years. And this explains, I think, why the American patriots, most notably up in New England, um, picked up arms after 10 years of attempting to resist these, uh, this imposition on their liberties and on their rights. Uh, we oftentimes think of the Declaration of Independence as popping out of the head of Thomas Jefferson. Um, there actually was a committee of five, a committee on which Roger Sherman, this old Puritan from Connecticut, was a member. Um, the committee changed what Jefferson wrote. It then went to Congress, 
Congress changed what Jefferson wrote. And this is a very important point, especially young people. I want you to pay attention to this. And when you're interpreting a text, you need to think of who the author of the text is. And in this case, it's authored by a community, right? What, came, what Jefferson penned was changed significantly and it only had authority because it was appointed, because Congress approved it. Now I'm gonna read a list of names, and you won't recognize most of the names, but I wanna read them anyway. These are the reformed members of Congress that signed off in the Declaration of Independence. And I'm gonna read the list just to make it clear that Jefferson is not acting alone. Among those that approved the Declaration were Josiah Bartlett, William Whipple, Matthew Thornton, John Hancock, Samuel Adams, John Adams. Robert Treat Payne, William Ellery, Roger Sherman, William Williams, Samuel Huntington, Oliver Wolcott, William Floyd, Philip Livingston, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, John Hart, Abraham Clark, James Smith, James Wilson, Thomas McKeon, and Lyman Hall. Now, what I want to submit to you is there's language in the Declaration referencing to things like nature's God. Now that kind of sounds like an enlightenment way of referencing God, but I can assure you these reformed Christians, they took this to simply be a reference to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This was not um, the God of the enlightenment, at least in their minds, whatever else it might have been for Roger Sherman. So the, the community that approved the Declaration of Independence, I want to suggest, was crystal clear that we are re revolting in part based on the idea that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A, a fundamentally Christian, or at least theological um, argument. Now, you might say, Hall, you're just imposing modern constructs on the 18th century. Well, that's not the case. I could give you a lot of quotes along these lines. Let me just mention a few. Um, Loyalists or, or, or members of the royalty who believed that the war for American independence was being pushed by Calvinists. The loyaler Peter Oliver railed against Mr. Otis's black regiment, the dissenting clergy who took so active a part in the revolution. The dissenting clergy, of course, re it refers to the non-Anglican clergy, the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, um, Baptists who reformed at the time, Dutch reformed, and others. Um, the, um, the King George re reportedly referred to the War for American Independence as a Presbyterian rebellion. And historians have long recognized that there was almost, I'm quoting here, almost unanimous and persistent critical attitude of the Congregational and Presbyterian ministers towards British imperial policy. The Anglican ministers in America were split about 50-50. 50, 50. 50 supported the Patriot cause, 50 supported the Loyalists. It was about 98 to 2 for reformed clergy. Virtually every Presbyterian minister, Congregational minister, Baptist minister, Dutch reform minister, and whatnot, they're all on the side of the Patriots, which again, I want to suggest there's something about reform political thought that informed the Patriot movement. There are a few exceptions, um, but very few indeed. Let me press on to the Constitution. Now, the Constitution has been called by political scientists and historians like R. Lawrence Moore and Isaac Kramnik a godless document. And what they mean by this is that it's, it's somehow a fundamentally secular document. Well, this would come as a remarkable surprise to Roger Sherman, Nathaniel Gorham, Caleb Strong, John Langdon, and Nicholas Gil Gilmore, Abraham Baldwin, James Wilson, Gunning Bedford, James McHenry, William Livingston, William Patterson, Hugh Wilson, Jared Ingersoll, Oliver Ellsworth, John Lansing, Robert Yates, James McClure, William Blount, William Houston, William Davey, and Alexander Martin. Now, these are all delegates to the convention that are coming from reformed background. Some of them are better Calvinists than others. I've done extensive work on a number of them. James Wilson, Roger Sherman, we'll talk a little bit about Sherman later. Um, some of them are very, very influential. Um, for instance, um, uh, the political science David Brian Robertson recently demonstrated, I think he demonstrated, that Sherman was a more effective delegate than James Madison. When Madison and Sherman agreed on a number of things, where they disagreed, James, Roger Sherman beat James Madison. And yet he also recognized that without the political synergy between Madison and Sherman, we may very well not have had a constitution. All right, but then you might say, Professor Hall, why is the deity, why is God not mentioned in the Constitution, at least not till you get to the date line in the year of our Lord, 1787? And there I would suggest we simply cannot judge the, um, the, 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 the 
Christian nature of anything by counting up references to the deity, to God. It just simply doesn't make sense. And secular historians won't take this approach either, at least with the Declaration of Independence that clearly references God four or five times, depending on how you count it. What I would suggest is far more important than counting up references to God or lack of references to God. We need to think about intellectual influence. And I'll just give one of these things. In other um, books I've authored, such as Did America Have a Christian Founding, I lay out five or so different major principles. One is most obvious, and you guys will pick up on this right away. In order to make you, make, make, make you understand why this is important, let me point out that oftentimes, and I referenced this earlier, that people point to the Enlightenment. Uh, uh, sweeping Europe in the late 17th and throughout the 18th century, the Enlightenment explains America. The Enlightenment is all about reason, and Enlightenment thinkers, at least by this time, generally assume that people are good, right? People are good, and we should use reason to govern ourselves, and education is very important. It would seem to follow from that, and Enlightenment thinkers argue this, that what we need is a strong central government, run by the experts. Doesn't that kind of make sense? We'll get scientists and engineers and college professors to run everything from the top down because we certainly can't trust the uneducated local yokels, right? America's founders took almost the exact opposite approach. They said, um, in the words of James Madison, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But he goes on to say men aren't angels. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He doesn't actually say that in Federalist 51. But this is a basic approach, right? All have sinned. We're all sinful. And even Christians continue to struggle with the old man within. Therefore, we need a very limited national government. And the national government that we do have needs to have power carefully constrained by separation of powers, checks and balances. Again, something very unlike what Enlightenment political thought was advocating for at the time. Now, one could come to the conclusion that humans are bad for any number of reasons, right? Um, you can simply observe human nature. Um, you, you could perhaps read certain secular thinkers. But again, I want to remind you, and many of you who go to this church or go to this academy know it's a pretty core reform doctrine that humans are totally depraved, right? In, in the words of Tulip. Um, this is something ingrained in Calvinists from the, um, from the earliest age. And so when 50 to 75% of these founders are Calvinists, I would suggest that it, it probably best explains why they had this view. Um, one could become a pacifist for any number of reasons. I teach at a Quaker school. Quakers are historically pacifists. I have Quaker colleagues who were raised in the Quaker church and who are, in fact, pacifists. If I'm going to explain why they're pacifists, it could be any number of reasons, of course. They might have viewed um, war from a distance and concluded it was bad. They might, they might have read Gandhi. These are all possibilities, but at least the most obvious explanation to look at is maybe they actually listened to what they were taught in the friends meeting and by their Quaker parents and this sort of thing. All right, so let me shift gears lastly and finally to the First Amendment. The First Amendment, and here particularly we're interested in the religion clauses. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, in 1947, the court began making a very bad historical argument. The court said we must interpret the Establishment Clause in light of the Founders' views, but we're only going to look to Thomas Jefferson and James Madison as the relevant Founders. Madison and Jefferson wanted a wall of separation between church and state, and so therefore this is what the Establishment Clause requires. Now, again, hopefully, even if you aren't social scientists yet, um, alarm bells should be going off. Wait a minute, Hall. Aren't these two Anglicans? And didn't you already tell me that Anglicans are only 15% of the American population? And isn't Jefferson a little bit of an oddball anyway, having spent so much time over in Europe? What about the 50 to 75% of Americans who are Calvinists? Well, I can assure you at this era, Calvinists are a lot more comfortable having a closer cooperation between church and state. The First Amendment, of course, doesn't affect establishments at the state level. And lo and behold, what we see is establishments continue in Vermont until 1807, Connecticut, 1819, New Hampshire, 1819, Maine, 1820, and Massachusetts, 1833. Now, I don't think establishments are a good thing, but I do think there are proper ways for the, the, the state to encourage Christianity or morality. And believe me, Calvinists are a lot more open to those sorts of ways, certainly Calvinists in this era. So if we are really interested 
And what the framers of the First Amendment were trying to do, what the ratifiers of, of, of the First Amendment were trying to do in this respect, doesn't make any sense to look at Jefferson and Madison. Jefferson, incidentally, didn't even help write the First Amendment or ratify it. Or should we look at the broader population, even just the founders, to say nothing of people in the states? Um, this is what I think we obviously should do. And yet, here I actually have a graph for you. Um, if you look at all the U.S. Supreme Court religion clause cases, when they cite individual founders, the blue there is James Madison, the red is, is Thomas Jefferson, and that little yellow, little yellow um, line there is Roger Sherman. Now let me tell you a bit, little bit about Roger Sherman. I promised we would get back to him. Just because I want to illustrate, I think he helps illustrate the fact that just because you aren't one of these big five or six, just because you aren't a George Washington, doesn't mean you're small potatoes. Sherman was a wonderfully godly man, I've already suggested, a ruling elder in his church. Um, uh, he went to Jonathan Edwards Jr.'s church. Jonathan Edwards Jr., just like his daddy, had a um, tendency to, to, to isolate, um, isolate or, or alienate parishioners. The only reason he kept his pulpit so long is because Roger Sherman had his back. Um, Roger Sherman was one of the only men who helped craft the Declaration of Independence, remember he was on the Committee of Five, the Articles of Association, the Declaration of Resolves, the Articles of Confederation, and the U.S. Constitution. And like Madison, he was in the first federal Congress, all right? So he plays an intimate role in drafting the First Amendment. Um, when the First Amendment came up, James Madison said, hey, we should put these amendments in the text of the Constitution. Sherman said, no, we shouldn't. That would be like mixing iron, bronze, and clay, a biblical reference. I'm sure you guys pick up on that, right? So they ought to go at the end. They shouldn't be mixed in there. Every single amendment that Madison proposed was changed in important ways. The amendment that he said was the very most important one of all, one that would restrict the states, was eliminated altogether. The only draft of the Bill of Rights that we have is actually in the handwriting of Roger Sherman. Um, in the final conference committee, um, James Madison was one of the three members of the House, but so was Roger Sherman. The head of the Senate committee was Sherman's protege, Oliver Ellsworth. So what I want to suggest, and this is only one of the other founders, right? A founder like Roger Sherman was a major player in these debates. He's no George Washington, I'm not arguing that, but he had a major, he played a lot more of a role in, in drafting the First Amendment than Washington ever did. And that's not to take anything away from Washington, he was busy being president. If we really are interested in the original understanding of an amendment like this, we have to, we just simply have to consider people like Roger Sherman, Oliver Ellsworth, John Langdon, Caleb Strong, Payne Wingate, Philip Shiler, Abraham Baldwin, Jonathan Elmer, William Patterson, Fisher Ames, Abigail Foster, Benjamin Huntington, James Jackson, Jedediah Wadesworth, N Nicholas Gilman, Egbert Benson, James Sherman, Henry Wycoop, Daniel Heister, Daniel Hunger, Benjamin Bourne, William Patterson, William Smith, and Hugh Williamson. Now, some of these men obviously played a lot more major of a role in drafting the First Amendment than others, but on my short list of people who played a major role would have to go Sherman, Ellsworth, Huntington, Baldwin, Boudinot, Patterson, and Ames. None of these men advocated anything like a wall of separation between church and state. And so my argument here largely is a historical argument. If we really want an accurate understanding of the American founding, if we want an accurate understanding of the intent of the bodies that drafted the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, we just simply have to look beyond a few brilliant Anglicans like uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. They're brilliant, they must be studied, they're very important, but again, we have to look at the broader community that put these documents together, and when we do that, we will see Calvinists play a major, major role. Well, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you very much, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, let's take a break uh, for 30 minutes until 8.15.